everybody, welcome to another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, and here with his March Madness picks, my co-host, Julio Vela. What's going on? Do you have your picks? Dukes to win. I picked Texas along. I, yeah, I know um, you big, picked the Retrievers. Yeah, you know, it didn't work out as we should. I'm about three or four behind. But That's all? Uh, that's all. But Dukes to win. How much have you lost gambling so far on this? <laughs> well, <clears throat> what? Is there a law? Is there a law about that? <laughs> you know, the 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 what with the content of your speech should be regulated, okay? Because it ain't fair. You can't regulate my speech. You're not going to gag me, man. No gag orders over here. Unless it's historically unprotected, unprotected speech. That's right. You need your flow chart. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if only somebody had a flow chart. Yeah. If only somebody did. And the man who created that flow chart, he's going to be our guest tonight. Mark Bennett joins us. Mark, good to have you back on the show. Good to be here, Jimmy. Thank you. And coming out of the booth to join us, you were a host a couple weeks ago. Once filling again? in for, uh, you're filling in for Julio, weren't you? I was. Yeah. I was. Justin, Justin occupied this spot and you occupied that one. Yeah, we tried to fill your seat. Victoria Ofresoglu is back. Uh, how do you feel being here rather than there? I like this seat better. Yeah. Because I can see everyone better, I feel like. Really? And I can see your lovely face. Oh, well, I love your hair. Oh, thank I you. I like it. Thank I was you. just noticing everybody at this table has better hair than me. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just it's just but you have your 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 brain is bigger than everyone's hair though. Oh man. You know? I know. Man. Is that that's your compliment? <laughs> Thanks, man. Hey, you know, I do what I can. I do what I can. Well, that's why you have such a huge forehead, Mark. <laughs> yeah, right. It's because you're brain yeah, too exactly, big. Exactly, exactly. You know what I mean? We're going to be here for the next hour, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, talking with Mark and Victoria. They just argued, well, Victoria just argued a uh, case that Mark had some uh, some interest in. Let's just say I that. I sat second. Oh, you did sit second. Yeah, Vicky let me sit second. She did an awesome job. Talk. So proud of no, her. I wanted yeah. to go see. I just got a I text saw, message. I, I just got the brief with your name on it. It didn't have your name on it. And so I was like, wait, well, okay. Yeah, I've been I just saw you tweeting it about it. I, I elbowed my way in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting at I'm sitting at Char and I get a text. Oh, Vic just finished arguing. I'm like, I know. Char. Char, that's a place that sells alcoholic beverages. You could have been at the Court of Appeals I know. instead. I didn't watching know. your colleagues I, I would, argue a very important First to. Amendment case. Justin says, oh, Vic just killed it. And I was like, where? He was watching Gambelcast over at Char on his <laughs> March Madness. <laughs> I mean, also important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, over illegal files to his phone. Yeah. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But uh, we'll open up the phone lines about halfway through the program so you can call in with any questions you have for Mark, Victoria, myself, and Julio. We'll also have Twitter up at HCCLA underscore TV, so you can hit us up there for, as well for questions and comments. So uh, well, let's just jump right into it. Tell us about the appeal, Victoria. What's, what, tell us about the case. Tell us about your experience at the Court of Appeals. It is a... And letting Mark elbow, elbow his way into your case. I gladly asked him, and he graciously agreed to help. Um, actually, I looked at all of Mark's uh, work. He's done a lot of First Amendment work, as everybody here knows. And um, this one was a challenge of Section 3712 of the Texas Penal Code, which is supposed to be a targeting false impersonation of police officers, except that there's already a statute, 3711, which does that much better, and constitutionally. So this was... Oh, um, maybe. <laughs> may, may, maybe. Uh, we're not conceding that quite yet. Correct. Victoria. Thank you, Mark. That's right. Um, but 3712, I think, is is a very good example of a statute that's um, substantially overbroad under the First Amendment because it chills protected speech, which so, is So allowed. what's the First Amendment? Give us the facts of the case yeah. first. And I'm, why, I'm, I'm why, did, why is, why, yes, why are you there? Well, I'm hesitant to give you the facts because they don't matter because it's a facial challenge right. to the statute. Um, but basically, there's a, an allegation that there was an item bearing law enforcement insignia, uh, which my client may or may not have possessed. He was accused of possessing He was it. accused of possessing. Of just possessing it, right? Not of using it, not of trying to badge his way in somewhere. He's just accused of possessing it. Correct. Just accused of possessing it because 3711 is the statute that charges you if you have the item and you intend to induce somebody to do something based on your pretended authority. Arrest somebody when you're not a cop or badge your way into the courthouse. 3712, however, which is what we're fighting about. Right, is just possessing the thing. And I'm arguing that possessing these things is protected expression under the First Amendment because um, just because you have something that says NYPD or HPD on it doesn't mean you're trying to be a cop. 
So, because, I mean, uh, if you had a hat that said NYPD or... One of the cases under this statute was a hat saying DPS. Guys wearing a hat saying DPS. They said that's insignia of the Department of Public Safety. Not the Delhi Public Schools or the Detroit Public Schools. I mean, I've got a Houston Texans hat. Does that mean I play for the team? You're representing yourself to be yeah. Houston Apparently. Texans. Exactly. Yeah. So, is this where somebody, you know, it, it, if you wear a military jacket or a military uniform, just, and you're not going off saying, I'm in the military or anything like that, but you're just wearing it. Is this the kind of, I guess, content that 3712 is trying to prohibit or statutes like that? I think so, because what matters is, well, to be fair, the statute says if you have the item and the item, uh, you use it in a way or you have it in a way that identifies you as being a part of the law enforcement agency, except that it doesn't say what that means. There's no specific intent that you hold yourself out to be an officer when you're not, or that you're doing anything other than having the thing. So I think you're right. And I think Justice Jennings made a good point, which is that just having the badge identifies you as, as an officer. You don't, it doesn't have to have your name on it. You don't have to say I'm an officer. Just having it, having this insignia identifies you as, as a police officer. Right. And, and shouldn't that be a problem? I think it is. The prosecutor, um, actually conceded that most badges don't have, you know, officers' names on them because they just have the insignia on them, which is content in and of itself. But also, um, in Mark's case, in Ex Parte Lo, the court said that if you have to look at the content of the message to determine whether a crime's been committed, then it's probably, well, it is a content-based restriction. But this one goes even further because I, I think you have to look at the intent of the speaker, which is another Supreme Court case that Mark was the one who told me about, Reed versus Town of Gilbert. Um, there's there's lots of aspects of this statute that are uh, problematic under so First Amendment. You asked if that's a problem, um, right. and I, I think you, your question was, isn't shouldn't we be preventing people from wearing badges that identify oh. them as cops? I think the argument that appealed most to the panel of judges was that this bars even possession in your own home. You could have a collection of these badges, nobody else could ever see them, it's a crime because you possess them and because having them identifies you as an officer of whatever sort. So you might have a, a drawer full of badges in your own home. You might even take them out and put them on in your own home when nobody else is around, you're committing a crime. Yeah, but should it, shouldn't be. if I'm wearing a badge and it says sheriff, if I'm wearing a badge and it says sheriff. I can buy one of those at Bucky's. But right. should, shouldn't that be sheriff a problem? Sheriff Jimmy, right? Yeah. <laughs> If they, sheriff Jimmy. If yeah. I'm walking around and I, and I, and you know what, and people ask me, "Are you a sheriff?" I'm not doing nothing. You a sheriff? I say, oh, "I'm a sheriff." Yes, I am. Um, but why isn't there? A, it, doesn't the government have an interest in saying no? Because we don't want people confusing you with the sheriff. Let me tell you about one of the cases, and it, the, it's a case that was a conviction for 3712, where they used the word sheriff. The sheriff, the word sheriff, was on the badge. And the court said that because that's an office in the state of Texas which can hire officers, it's a law enforcement agency, and that's good enough. But it also said that because the uh, badge had a star on it, that that was also indicative of a law enforcement agency. And I don't think that um, we want to go down that road because what if the government says there's other shapes or words that are um, insignia of law enforcement agency. I mean, the star is a very Dallas Cowboys historical. must be a law, law enforcement yeah. agency. And I think we want to keep track of the fact that it, the statute doesn't just cover the person who's pretending to be a cop. It also covers the collector, right? So, right. so and that's the overbreadth question, right? So even if the state could legitimately forbid people from pretending to be cops, maybe they can, maybe they can't, um, they, they can't, they certainly can't forbid us from possessing these insignia in our own homes which the statute does. It prevents the collection of them. You couldn't collect old HPD badges or old Texas Ranger badges. So, if, if, Sorry, Jamie, yeah. but just on that point, if they do have, let's say they do have a government interest in doing that, that's fine. Just make a law that is narrowly tailored to fit that interest so that it comports with the First Amendment. I mean, nobody's telling them they can't have such a law. It's just I this am. one. Well. <laughs> well, okay, so this is where, so I watched your oral argument, okay, and on the, on the, the revenge, case, porn. revenge porn case. And it, it appeared that, Victoria, you were making a, an argument that if a law intrudes on historically unprotected speech or 
not right right hey, the, the 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 state can legitimately forbid speech in recognized categories of historically unprotected speech obscenity There's child nine. porn defamation and then others fighting words true threats i can never remember all incitement of speech integral to criminal conduct um, I think Threats. that's nine. And then preventing uh, some grave harm, but it's a very narrow category. Yeah, the remember. First Amendment guy can't even remember them all. Yeah, no. How am I supposed to? I just know that the, these things don't fall into <laughs> it. <laughs> so the government's trying to regulate what you, what people um, can and can not possess. possess. It appeared, and I'm not a First Amendment uh, free speech, and I'm not, a, not that smart, but it appeared that um, but you like to gamble. The, well, it appeared that the argument huh, that, that Victoria was making that strict scrutiny applied. However, in your argument, at least from what I gathered, said in the revenge porn case that if it's not a recognized category, strict scrutiny shouldn't even, we're well, not even, we shouldn't even talk about these things. Well, so, so the law pretty clearly says strict scrutiny applies, but the question is, what does that mean in this context? And I, I contend that if the statute is substantially overbroad, that's the end of the strict scrutiny analysis, that you don't even look at whether there is a compelling governmental interest, because you can't have a compelling governmental interest that justifies substantial overbreadth. So that's sort of what the fight was about in Mora, and that's what you know our, our supplemental brief in this case is going to explain to the court, along with this lovely flowchart. Is the fact that it's overbroad because why in the uh, be, right because it forbids a real and substantial amount of protected speech and protected speech is any speech outside of those nine categories of unprotected speech now the state could the legislature or court could recognize a new category but the the standard for recognizing new category is very high and the supreme court hasn't done it in i don't know 30 years probably so <clears throat> It appeared in in your argument that the the panel was trying to trigger this um, strict scrutiny test, or they wanted they want to look at the compelling governmental interest, right? So I, I showed that the statute is substantially overbroad. Well, they want they want to say, well, okay, so it's substantially overbroad, but doesn't the the compelling governmental interest outweigh that? And the Supreme Court has already spoken to this. You don't do a balancing test, which is what that would be, right? You balance right. the interest against the overbreadth and, and see which weighs more. Uh, the Supreme Court in its case law has, has said we're applying strict, strict scrutiny, but then has ended the inquiry with it's substantially overbroad. It's substantially overbroad and therefore unconstitutional. And they've done this in uh, they've done this in recent cases, and they've done it. If you look back, you see it in older cases as well, where once they find substantial overbreadth, they don't even look at the compelling governmental interest. So we have the you can't wear a sheriff badge. We you have you can't possess you can't a you can't possess badge. a sheriff badge or any item. <clears throat> yeah. a, any item. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we have another including have, a vehicle, by the way. Well, okay. So I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> we have uh, lawyers in our in our city. Mark Deason one. Amazing truck, by the way. But uh, I saw a recent um, query uh, about another individual wrapping their car, and the state bar said, why do you have to make it look like a police car? And the response was, well, why don't you look at all the police cars around the state, and you'll find that police cars comes in all, comes in, in all shapes of colors, kinds of colors, shapes, um, designs. And used to until they standardized everything. Right. Well, I mean, and, thanks, Obama. Yeah. And couldn't that be, or would that be, content if they tried to regulate that in some way? So, uh, the the state bar is allowed to regulate some things for lawyers, professional speech that the government can't regulate for the general population is the answer to that. So the state bar can set speech rules for us, has been allowed to, probably will still be allowed to, that would never pass muster with the general public. So we have, you, you can't possess um, ins th insignias or law enforcement of a star or sheriff or caps with DPS on them. We have the revenge porn. What it, uh, can you talk to us about what the revenge porn uh, statute is and what it prohibits? So the revenge porn statute forbids uh, non-consensual publication of erotic images, basically. So if you have a picture of somebody and you know that it was made without the intent that it be spread far and wide, 
and it depicts them naked or having sex, you're not allowed to publish it under the revenge porn statute. So revenge porn, we think, well, we, we hear revenge porn, we think it's for revenge. The statute covers more than just you know, a, a, an intent to, com to uh, get some sort of revenge. It's just the non-consensual publicate, non-consensual, maybe pornography, non-consensual erotica. That's what the revenge porn statute forbids. And that speech falls into none of those categories of unprotected speech. Well, shouldn't the, should consent be something that's considered in the, in the analysis of that? No. Why? No. Because if we start saying you can't say things about people without their consent, investigative journalism goes away. Right? You've, and you've always got to look at, okay, if we make this exception to the general rule that speech is protected, what are the effects of that exception? If the exception is based on a lack of consent, we say lots of things about people without their consent. I do it all the time on my blog and it hurts people's feelings. Well, you know, if, if you forbid speech that is non-consensual or speech that hurts people's feelings or embarrasses them, which is another element of the revenge porn statute, it has to cause harm, which includes embarrassment um, or offense, then you know, where, where does that stop? If we, if we decide that those, are, those specific criteria are worthy of restricting speech, then well, you know, what's, why not investigative, investigative journalism? Why not anything, you know, why not just say nobody can say anything mean about anybody else without their consent? Well, mm. you know, who's gonna consent to people saying mean things about them? I agree. I noticed in your brief that you said that uh, the uh, the statute uh, doesn't have any sort of like intent to induce the person to do anything. Do anything. Yeah. Why is that important? Well, I think it's important because it it would at least limit the reach of the statute a little bit because then the government would have to prove that you possess the item with the intent that you were going to do something bad with it, right? That you're going to deceive or defraud or induce or whatever. But in this case, there is no intent requirement. So they don't have to show any of that. They just have to show that you had it and that you're not a cop. And um, that's why it prohibits a, a real and substantial amount of protected speech because you could be wearing it to show support in a Blue Lives Matter way or because your dad was a cop or because you're trying to remember 9-11, but communication is a two-way street. If somebody sees me walking down the street and thinks I'm trying to hold myself out as a cop because I have a shirt on or a badge on that says <coughs> HPD, then I, you know, that's enough that, that I've committed a crime. And I just don't think that's right. Even if you have the uniform in the closet in your house. <laughs> well, what if they ask, hey, are you a cop? And you say, yes. I mean, and you're lying now. Does that matter? Well, don't you think that changes things? If, if, I'm, if I'm holding myself out and trying to induce them to do something, I think that might be 3711. Well, but the problem is, I mean, what about when you get dressed up on Halloween? And I you walk around a as point. a cop. Yeah. I mean, they sell police outfits, sure. some of them a little racier than others. Right, right. But, uh, Jimmy but, the sexy sheriff. That's right. <laughs> right. I saw that. It's terrible. Yeah, you saw it on yourself in the mirror. <laughs> can't can't uh, unsee it. But, I mean, seriously, you could get, you could get arrested for wearing a, a Halloween costume under there, that theory. Uh, so the statute has exceptions for artistic, dramatic, or decorative purposes. And uh, you know, maybe a, a cop seeing you dressed up as a cop would say, oh, it's Halloween, this is dramatic purposes, but not necessarily, right? And what we look at is the chilling effect of the statute. And the statute has the same chilling effect whether a cop has the discretion to make that call, oh, this is dramatic, this is artistic, or not. Yeah. You know, when I started researching this, because I have had this case for a while now, but I found a review online um, by a mom who had a son with special needs with Down syndrome, and um, she was posting a review because she purchased some items with law enforcement insignia on them for her son to wear because he always wanted to be a cop. And I just kept thinking, they're both committing a crime. But his IQ was too high to be a cop. Yes. <laughs> oh, burn. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's, hey, hey, we should restrict that. We should restrict it. I think you've heard some people's feelings. That kind of speech. <laughs> you've heard some people's speech. Well, okay. So, okay. Oh, yeah, let's so how, talk about about it. how about that? Yeah. How about a Texas statute that forbids hate speech against cops? There are states that have tried to pass these statutes. They may very well have in the last couple of years said, well, you know, if you say things about cops that, that are without their consent and hurt their feelings, that's a crime. And our president would be in trouble. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, he's at least, at least that's one to. theory, right? Someone else got fired today, I think, or quit. Yeah, his so lawyer. Oh yeah, his lead and, lawyer quit. And another one too. Yeah, yeah. So, isn't hate speech banned though? Is, is no. or no? No, there's, there's legally, there's no such thing. I mean, hate uh, speech is, you know, it's speech that hurts people's feelings, and we don't yet in this country 
forbid speech because it hurts people's feelings. What about burning the flag? Is that illegal anywhere? No, nope. protected speech. It should be. Un- it, it should be unprotected. So, so the most recent case on that, yeah, the most recent case on that is is a State versus Johnson out of the Court of Criminal Appeals, and the the Court of Criminal Appeals wrote just fine opinion saying this is constitutionally protected this the statute is unconstitutional but the judges all felt it necessary to sort of wave their own flags well we're not doing this because we approve of flag waving of course we don't or flag burning of course we don't approve of flag burning but the constitution is the constitution they shouldn't they shouldn't feel it necessary to do that but that's i think that's a byproduct of having elected judges they had this quote in there that was kind of, i'm probably going to butcher it but it's something like if um, <coughs> You can't force people to engage in nationalism or patriotism, and the the cure for that is not enforced silence, but more speech. So if people want to, you know, burn the flag and protest, that's America. It's America. That's why we have the First Amendment. In that case, they were protesting. I think Reagan was a protest. The picket well, case. Well, you're thinking of Texas versus oh, I, my, Johnson. Okay. More recently, there was State versus Johnson, which oh. just went to the Court of Criminal Appeals, and the guy claimed he he wasn't even trying to protest anything. He was just he was just pissed off the store. He was tearing down the flag. But the question was whether the statute, which addresses flag burning, was unconstitutional because flag burning is generally communicative. I mean, people generally don't burn flags unless they intend to communicate something. Right. It's not, you know, it's so, it's not just a general criminal mischief statute. It's directed at one particular piece of fabric. Okay. So then when can our government regulate historically unprotected speech? Obscenity, child pornography, defamation, true threats. I'm going to run out of steam here. I think you brought up something, something called uh, incidental speech integral to criminal conduct. That's a okay. Category that's, okay. Of so that's like the example there that Mark came up with. I think it was yesterday. Was uh, let's say you had a conspiracy afoot, and there was speech involved to, you know, commit the conspiracy, or. Um, What's another good example? But the point is it's the crime that is happening and the speech is incident to the crime. The speech isn't the crime itself. There's some non-speech crime that the speech helps or causes to occur. Child pornography is a good example because child pornography, the theory is that the possession of child pornography causes a market for child pornography. The market for child pornography causes the production of child pornography and the production of child pornography is sexual abuse of children. So the, the, the rationale for forbidding child pornography is that, well, I mean, that's the, the stuff is created for the people who consume it, and in the course of creating it, there is an actual real-world non-speech crime committed. You talked about something called the secondary effects doctrine, where it affects brick-and-mortar structures in dealing with child pornography and such no no for for it's uh, that's a sexually oriented business doctrine okay uh, there is what's called the secondary effects doctrine which is that bricks and mortar uh, sexually oriented businesses can be regulated based on their secondary effects on the neighborhood they attract crime right and and people dump garbage or whatever uh, the state tried in the uh, has tried in the child pornography um, I'm sorry in the uh, revenge porn context to say, well, we're, we're doing this because of the secondary effects. But the Supreme Court has never uh, applied secondary effects doctrine to anything other than sexually oriented businesses. Did the panel seem to be a little more educated with you than they did with Mark? <laughs> because they were like, they didn't know what they were talking about, in my opinion. Yeah. But how did you go? How well, they it? asked a lot of questions, and I think... Um, I think one of them asked pretty good, intelligent questions based on the law. I think one of them probably is going to go back and read or reread some cases because of some things that um, were said. <laughs> you uh, are so kind. You are such a kind well, human being. You know, they asked a lot She's of awesome. questions. She's not willing to throw out the hate <laughs> That's speech. really awesome. Uh, See, I, I, think, just th- I just throw her to the wolves. Well, Mark Bennett can do that, but... I'm green still, so I don't know. Well, I'll say this. I don't think that all of them read my brief. I, I can say that with confidence. I don't think that they read, at least not or, all of it. Or or at least they didn't read the cases cited in the brief. Yeah. They didn't, didn't think about them. There was there was one justice who, that one of the key, the key case probably in this instance, I would say, is, is United States versus Alvarez. Right. Where the U.S. Supreme Court said, 
the Stolen Valor Statute is unconstitutional. It's constitutionally protected if you pretend to have the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest medal that, that the military gets, right, from Congress. Um, and this, and one, one justice on the panel said, first of all, this was during my rebuttal, she said, um, how is this any different than pretending that you have a medal that you didn't earn? Because you can't go around doing that. Well, no, so it's two-parter, right? So well. the first part is, how is this any different? <laughs> exactly right, Judge. It's, there's no different. There's absolutely no difference. It's exactly the same thing. And then she said, well, you're not allowed to, it's not constitutionally protected. You can't go around pretending to have a medal that you, that you, that you didn't get. Actually, you can. That's U.S. versus Alvarez. That's what? It's United States versus Alvarez. <laughs> it's in the brief. It, no, I saw that, and, it, and you uh, 2012. Re respectfully disagreed with them a number oh, this, of times. This was in this was yesterday. This, oh, this was yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, this was this yesterday. This was yesterday. Wow. Oh, yeah. 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 So more educated. I think. I think Justice. I think Justice Yates uh, Jennings was was more educated. Um, I think that Justice Higley was quiet, and it's hard to tell. I think she's a. She was paying close attention, but not asking a lot of questions. Um, and I think the other justice uh, needs to hit the books. The state, <laughs> the state kept um, saying that. Well, in the, in the Mora, in the revenge in porn the revenge argument. porn case, uh, right? Re revenge porn. I mean, the, the argue, you know, the the framework is the same for all of these cases, but the state makes different arguments. So I'm sorry. Go on. No, but it it goes back in line with they kept wanting. The way I saw it, was. You kept saying that, hey, look, this isn't one of the categories. Um, if it's not one of the categories, then uh, the government should be should not be making any uh, laws restricting that unless they can show proof that there's some pattern or some right. development. Ex there. Well, so so the the Supreme Court has said we might recognize another category, but the state would have to show evidence of a historical forbidding of this sort of speech. And of course, that doesn't exist with revenge porn. The state comes in and says, well, these 38 states have passed revenge porn statutes. Well, that's fine, but they've all done it within the last decade. That's not a historical pattern. What what the court's talking about in terms in, in the history context is they're talking about, you know, this is the sort of speech that was forbidden in 1789. 1791. Right. Right. There, when the Constitution was written or when the Bill of Rights was written, well, you know, what, what, you know, what was the state of the law then? Then why did the state keep saying that, well, in the Alvarez case or, and in the, uh, was it the Thompson? Stevens. Stevens. Mm -hmm. And they also, the Reed town versus right. town of Gilbert. Why did they keep saying that, well, then the, in the opinions, it came out with, uh, a strict scrutiny analysis, and they f and and they use that balancing or that test to do because so. Why were they? Were they? Why were they? I have saying a secret that? for you. All right. Most lawyers, including prosecutors and judges, don't understand free speech law very well. So they're doing the best they can. Half and this table doesn't understand it very well. <laughs> yeah, I can I'm tell you that. And it's that. The two I'm at the corner. I mean, <laughs> it's it, yeah, it's it's a very you know, we don't really learn it in law school. Right? No, you don't. Um, well, look, I mean, the general public doesn't understand it. how much have we how much have we seen over the last year with the NFL protests that people think that the NFL is somehow violating people's free speech by uh, not allowing them to pro uh, not allowing them to protest or not signing them. I mean, I would say that lawyers understand it a little bit better than the general public, but just a little bit. So the prosecutor slightly. makes these arguments because prosecutor has to make arguments. Um, they, I think this, I think that was the case where their brief didn't cite any Supreme Court right. case more recent than 1989. So, well, and so in my reply brief, I, you know, did somebody forget to pay for the subscription to, to the Supreme Court uh, reporters on this, you know, for this? Because they, there, there have been developments, right? 2010, there was Stevens, 2012, there was Alvarez. These are huge, huge First Amendment cases that, right. that pretty much define the, the, the way that, the Supreme Court will, at least until things change, will review free speech challenges. Yesterday, the prosecutor mentioned one case that dealt with content-based restrictions, and it was from the 70s. So I think that in my case, they didn't really talk about, other than to say that Alvarez doesn't apply, they didn't really talk about Stevens or Alvarez or any of those. And Stevens is interesting because the court says this statute forbids a real and substantial amount of protected speech, and therefore is unconstitutional. It's void. So they didn't, there's a specific example of a case where the Supreme Court didn't even go to the compelling state interest prong right. of strict scrutiny. So I would say, you know, there are lots of different ways of, of analyzing this, of describing this phenomenon of that being the end of the, the inquiry. One is to say that 
substantial overbreadth trumps any potential governmental interest. In the revenge porn um, arguments, the state argued that, look, you can write about your, in great detail, your, the love affair and the private happenings of your lover uh, all you want, and you can blog it, and you can talk about it, but you just can't post that picture. Is that a, is that a distinction that's... It's not a distinction of a sort that the Supreme Court, I think, would recognize. Um, so, all right, so if, if, we, if we want to create a new category, and I don't think we do, but if we want to create a new category that revenge porn falls into, uh, falls into then it needs to be something that other stuff doesn't fall into. So basically, we wind up recognizing this category, which is revenge porn, and revenge porn only. These photographs, non-consensual, that cause harm. Uh, I don't see the Supreme Court adopting such a narrow category of unprotected speech. The state was arguing that their limitations on what they can prosecute, for example, they, they can't prosecute you blogging about the secret love affair that you had about with so-and-so. Uh, you but, can use your name, Jake. <laughs> right. With but, you. <laughs> but that allowed it to be narrowly tailored. Um, it was interesting that, at least in my opinion, that it, you addressed it being, you did a strict, strict scrutiny kind of analysis in your brief, at least as I remember. Yes, because I did talk about U.S. v. Stevens. And, right. you know, like Mark said, in that case, they didn't even get to the government interest because they, they concluded that it was substantially overbroad. And that's one part of the strict scrutiny analysis and in the Stevens case the statute had a defense a, a subsection for defenses that listed all these kinds of protected speech right like if it's artistic if it's scientific if it's educational historical um, I think artistic was in there but there were a lot of exceptions in the Supreme Court there said that's still not good enough because a lot of what we say to each other doesn't have educational value or artistic value you can't prohibit speech because you can't fit it into one of these categories and to say that the statute is narrowly tailored is to read those exceptions very broadly and the court didn't want to do that so that's you know that's the same thing that's going on with 3712 only worse because there's only three exceptions why did in your brief or in I didn't get to see your arguments and I, and I heard you killed it okay and you heard you nailed it but, <laughs> But why, I mean, and I, I'm trying to see, on your end, when I, re, when I watched your argument, it was, uh, look, it's not in one of these categories, this, this statute's unconstitutional. However, you would almost seem to address what the court was trying to get you to address and say, oh, well, where's the government interest and where's the, let's do an analysis and a balancing test. In your brief, it almost seemed like you addressed that. Was that strategic or why would you, why, it was why would there be... Two reasons. Okay. Okay. The first reason was um, after I read U.S. v. Stevens, I wanted to talk about the exceptions because I thought that Stevens was really good for me. And um, there's a Florida case that had a very similar situation going on where there were two statutes targeting false impersonation of officers, one like 3711 here and one like 3712, and they struck down the Florida statute that was com comparable to 3712. And so that's why I didn't want to wow. leave that out. Because Who struck down? Florida, in Florida. I mean, it's not really? binding. But was it the Florida Supreme Court? Uh, it was a case called Sold v. Florida, but now I can't remember if it was a court of appeals or what kind of court it was. But there was that case, and there's a Ninth Circuit case, the Swisher case, that I thought was really good, right. except it's Ninth Circuit, um, which I love. I mean, I went to law school in California, so I love the Ninth Circuit. But, but not, not, not a lot of credibility with Texas Intermediate. No. no. <laughs> not so much. Not big fans of not the Ninth so much. Circuit. Yeah. The Swisher case had dealt with the other part of the federal statute that was involved in Alvarez. So you can lie about having received the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's Alvarez. But in Swisher, the Ninth Circuit said, you know what? You can also go around wearing it. And that's okay, too, because there's no more energy that's involved in your expression you know by saying that you've received it versus pinning one on so it's protected and I thought that that was good you know a good case on point for me and yeah. and so on your end why so I why was why would explain I, I think right. I think the state misunderstands substantial overbreadth I want I think they want to say well here are all the reasons the statute is narrow here's how it could be broader and because it's narrow in all these ways it's not substantially overbroad 
That's not what substantial overbreadth is. Substantial overbreadth is forbidding a real and substantial amount of protected speech. That's it. So you don't look at it and say, well, it could, it could have been written more broadly and therefore it's narrow. No, you look at it and say, okay, well, what protected speech does this statute forbid? In the case of the revenge porn statute, it's all revenge porn that doesn't fall into the categories of defamation or uh, child pornography uh, or obscenity, right? I'd, I'd love the example that you did with the, uh, the defamation where maybe two people are having sex and then you, you change their faces. That's a thing, yeah. yeah Mark I mean, mentioned that as oral yeah, argument. Yeah. yeah, so right. So that that could be, you know, there there's this new technology that I'm talking about of sticking other people's faces on the videos, right? Not just, you know, it's like Photoshop but for videos. Um, and more accessible technology now. So it's easy to make it look like somebody else is doing something that they're not doing. Well, that would be defamatory revenge porn because it would show somebody doing something that they really weren't doing. And def defamation requires falsity. What about like fake tweets and such? Would that be like if I'm fake tweeting Donald Trump or something? Would... Constitutionally protected, yeah. unless you're committing fraud. And that's why the, the motive for the badge is important. Because if you intend to get some benefit, then at least arguably, it's fraud, right? Mm. So, and fraud is unprotected speech. Mm -hmm. mm. So you know, the fake tweets, satire, even if, you're, you know, even if you intend for people to believe that it's actually the president, it's probably protected speech. Last I checked, this is America. This is America, and that's the cornerstone of democracy to be able to, you know, engage in parody and satire, and, and you know, that's been around for thousands of years. We have a real so. low tolerance for that today, but I want to remind everybody we've, uh, we're a little over halfway point of the show right now, so if you got any <laughs> questions, comments you want to call in with, 713-807-1794. We still have Twitter up and uh, nothing going on over here. So send us your tweets at HCCLA underscore TV. Yeah, I mean... You know, we just seem to be a society now that can't take satire. I mean, you go look back at some of the old Saturday Night Lives from the late 70s, even even up to the early 90s, I would say, um, and maybe into the late 90s. I mean, the, the stuff that they were doing there compared to what we're able to, we could tolerate as a society now, I mean, it's it's crazy. Why do you um, think that is? Why do y'all think that is? I, I recently rewatched Blazing Saddles. Oh, dude, you would never could they get away with making that now? No, no way, oh. not a chance. Or Spaceballs? I mean, no, they would never get, get out, out of here. I've got another one coming up, uh, First Amendment challenge on uh, one that Mark helped me out with on the harassment statute. And is that the one that I totally didn't respond to you because I was in jail court and I missed That's okay. Is, yeah, yeah, that one. How did that work out? Well, the hearing's coming up so, at, in the trial court hearing. So, so these categories of unprotected speech don't include harassment. People say, well, you can't harass each other. Uh, the Supreme Court hasn't said that. The Supreme Court has not said that harassment is unprotected speech. And what is harassment? It's hurting other people's feelings, it's embarrassing them, it's offending them, maybe alarming them, uh, but it's still, as far as we know, it's still protected speech. There was a difference, and I'm trying to understand it, between listeners versus the subject. Sure, right. So, so there's a case called Cohen versus California from the U.S. Supreme Court 1970, 72. Are we allowed to say four-letter words on... F. Russia. We could say F. I don't like F. Anyway, there, it, was, it was the... the there was a guy wearing a vest that suggested uh, obscene conduct with the draft. Suggested, suggested copulation with the draft. Suggest, it, it commanded copulation with the draft. Forceful and lawful it, carnal knowledge. <laughs> exactly. Right, right, right. 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 Um, and the, the, so in this case, the Supreme Court said, well... You can forbid speech to prevent people from hearing it, but only if it's an essentially intolerable invasion of their privacy. An example I like to give is making somebody's phone ring repeatedly or standing outside their house with a megaphone. It's, it's invasive of their privacy. People like to have their solitude while they're at home. Well, the, the state of Texas has grasped upon this invasion of privacy, essentially intolerable invasion of privacy language, and moved it over from the Cohen context, which is explicitly keeping people from hearing the speech, to the revenge porn or harassment context, which is protecting the subject of the speech from invasions of privacy. They're very different things. They're, they're, the, the subject's privacy and the hearer's privacy are really so different that an alien, somebody coming from Mars, wouldn't recognize them as being the same thing. Right. right. You're protected from 
people saying mean things about you, okay, I get that. You're protected from people saying mean things to you, okay, I get that. But those are different things. Right. We call them both privacy. And so this, the state of Texas has latched onto this. At some point, a court is going to tell them that they're not right about that. I have faith that at some point a court is going to say, yeah, Cohen versus California doesn't apply to revenge porn cases or harassment or whatever it is. What, and so can you go, can you talk about a little bit about what you're... I mean, I filed the writ. Can I talk about it a little bit? I don't, I, I don't know why not. I don't know why not either. Um, it's the hearings coming up. It's the online part of the harassment statute that I'm challenging, and that's what my client was charged under. So not the telephone part of the statute, just the just the electronic communication part of it. Repeated electronic communications mm -hmm. with the intent to cause Annoy, emotional harm. Harm. I mean, the list is kind of odd because, you know, if I sent a couple emails to you trying to make you understand something that I feel very passionate about and I'm trying to annoy you to get you to, like, listen, I'm committing a crime, apparently, because... Even if you are her congressman. She, oh, sends, wow. you, she sends you two emails trying to, to goad you into doing something that you should do, and, and she's intending to annoy you or embarrass you, and you're annoyed or embarrassed by these two emails, mm -hmm. she's committed a crime. I think I recently heard on NPR there was a congressman that started sending letters to their, his constituents that were repeatedly sending him letters about or inquiries about the position that he's on, and he sent them a letter saying, hey, you're harassing me, you need to stop. And it made news. And I think this is what we're, I mean, this might be something we're talking about. Like, hey, look, no, um, you know, that's, that might be uh, protected speech. Yeah, right? well, it is protected speech. It just means more than once, and it doesn't even tell you in what time frame. So does that mean repeated in a day, repeated in a week? Ever. I mean, two, two emails. Ever, if they, that is repeated, according to the Court of Criminal Appeals. If you were mm. to attack that statute on those grounds, would it invalidate the entire law or just that portion of it? I think just that portion of it, because wouldn't you have to challenge the telephone part of it to get the rest of it? Right. So, so the answer is that you can challenge, in a facial challenge, the portion of the statute that your client is charged under. So if your client is charged with the electronic portion of it, then you can't, in the course of that, attack the telephonic portion of it. But the, the same logic probably applies to the telephone communications as to the electronic communications. I don't know, maybe not. Making somebody's telephone ring is a different sort of privacy invasion than sending them an email, right? We can always right. shut off the computer. We can't necessarily shut off our phones because, you know, we... Yeah. We need them. And I mean, the next, time, says, next time I'm part of a group text and I get like 55 texts. <laughs> in three oh, I'm, span, I'm, I'm, call I'm, I'm telling everybody and saying, y'all are annoying me, y'all are and, all committing a yeah, crime. You, well, this, uh, this is annoying to me. If you send me another message, uh, you, you need to know that you're annoying me. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, it's not I'll, limited to email. <laughs> I will take <laughs> appropriate action. <laughs> because it's not limited to an email. It says electronic communication, which I think could be like Facebook, Twitter, a uh, forum. Uh, a letter typed on an electric typewriter. Oh, interesting. Anything that uses electronics yeah. to make the communication. So, so a telephone call too, for that matter. But, but right, it's very, very broad. Sounds to me that like that's overbroad. <laughs> Thank you. Killing it. So yeah, so Lane Haygood and I actually had a, a petition for discretionary review to the Court of Criminal Appeals on one of these harassment statutes, and we the PDR was refused, which means Court of Criminal Appeals refused to hear the case, but two judges on the Court of Criminal Appeals dissented and said they would have heard the case. And it was sort of an odd couple because it was presiding Judge Keller, who is sort of the far right wing of the court, but really good on First Amendment issues, and uh, Judge Alcala, who is the, the more defense-friendly side of the court. So we had these two judges agreeing that this should have been heard. Maybe Vicky's case is the one where they actually grant PDR. Never know. Mm. Well, if if you can, if they're going to grant you a hearing. Well, I've got gonna, a hearing right, in the trial court, and um, it's coming up. Six or three? Six. Oh, really? He came back and said he's going to hear it? Took it back, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So I have a theory about these cases, which is I'd rather lose in the trial court. Yeah. Because that way, when sure. we get into the Court of Appeals, I get to frame the issue. I get to write the first brief and explain to them, here's my, here's my flow chart. Take a look. Yeah. But, you know, in six... Victoria might win. I'm hoping Mark will come with me again. We'll see. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So when you're challenging the constitutionality of a statute, when can you do that and why? And does Fort Bend know the difference? 
When can you challenge it? I think as soon as you're confined by it in any way, including if you have to come back to court. Isn't that the rule? I think that's the rule. Yeah. Right. I, I think you're right. I think you're so, right. I think Fort Bend said no or something. Mm -hmm. uh, initially at the writ hearing, they said that I didn't have, and I think in their brief now that I think of it, they said that I didn't have standing. Yeah, they did say that, that I didn't have standing to challenge it. Uh, I'm not sure why they said that, but... That was their argument. Maybe everybody's subscription to Westlaw is running out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they're still working off of CDs from 1997. Yeah, the, the, the books. Um, I want to switch subjects a little bit. I know we've talked a lot about First Amendment, yeah. but I want to get you guys' thoughts because yesterday our attorney general came out and issued a mandate for... A fatwa. Yeah, for, for prosecutors, for AUSAs across the country to seek the death penalty where appropriate in drug-related cases. Um, one, I mean, this is, a, this is a big step. I mean, it, you don't see a lot of federal death penalty cases, uh, first off, and to have the Attorney General come in and mandate that to seek it in drug cases. Well, so, so to seek it in a drug case, there would have to be a death in the exactly. drug case. Right. You can't just say, oh, he's a drug dealer. We're gonna, and we're gonna, I think that's yeah. the misconception that's out there is that the, the headlines are, you know, oh, we, you know, attorney general wants to seek death penalty in drug related cases. But, you know, they're not explaining very well the fact that there needs to be a death. It has to be a dead body to, to right. seek death. The Supreme Court has pretty, pretty well said that. Pretty clearly said that. Yeah. But I mean, it, it is interesting, though, because a lot of these cases are that they're, they're really attacking the opioid ep epidemic. Uh, I think is what they're they're trying to go after, and we saw the, last week there were five doctors who were indicted in a involving a bribe and kickback scheme with uh, some pharmaceuticals um, and pushing the, the pharmaceuticals onto patients uh, in exchange for money. So I, I wonder, is that the next stage? I mean, a doctor who prescribes this stuff and, and a, somebody dies, and somebody dies. Mm. Would would the Department of Justice go the next step? Doesn't there have to be an intentional death? <sighs> I think they to have to be death penalty. And I, I think one of them has to be black. <laughs> not 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 the dead person. Not though. the dead person. <laughs> No, I kid, I kid, I kid. It oh. kind of sounds like the Philippines, wasn't it the... Duarte. Duarte. Yeah. Duarte. 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 Yeah. like yeah. executing people that had drug addiction problems and, yeah. well, there were no dead yeah. body requirements there, but... Right, so, so yeah, do, do we really want to spend resources on that? Does that really make the problem any better to start prosecuting people who are in drug cases? See, what I think of is the case where somebody gets murdered in the course of the drug conspiracy. Right. I think that would be a fair case to seek a, the death penalty in, but do we want to? Does that? Yeah. Well, I mean, they've done it. I mean, look, they, they, they've done it in cartel cases yeah. uh, before. They're, I don't think they're doing it on El Chapo. Uh, they make the allegation, of course, that if they've caused the deaths of several agents, and they're, but, but they're not seeking the death penalty on him. So it's kind of interesting. If you're not going to seek the death penalty on someone like El Chapo, mm. who, ha who would you seek the death penalty against <coughs> in, in a drug-related prosecution yeah I mean it's 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 a very bizarre mandate that comes out and, and it really I mean I haven't I haven't seen the well I don't know if, you, if, you, if they've even released a letter if it's just an internal memo uh, yet but I don't even know how you would make that case how how binding and or how much discretion do the US attorneys assistant US attorneys in their various districts have so I say this because recently there was a photo posted of Donald Trump, Sessions, and Ryan Patrick. It's on Facebook. I guess it has it. At, it's over at the Southern District of Texas. It is. And I thought to myself, on the cusp of this Sessions mandate or this Sessions uh, directive, I cannot imagine that Ryan Patrick would be seeking death on somebody. I mean, granted, I, I mean, okay, I guess it could, but. I don't see him like that. I haven't been able to see him like that. And so I'm wondering how much discretion those individuals have. Do you know or do are they like, hey, look, this is the directive. This is where we go with. Well, isn't their job to seek justice? Am I seek the truth? Am I wrong about that? If well, justice is so. It's all in the eye of the beholder. Right. Right. Uh, you and your like up here stuff. I like, yeah, I mean, how gosh. dare I? Yeah. Uh, I think that. AUSAs have used former memos as cover for for doing bad things to defendants. Absolutely. Uh, 
Now, are there ways to work around memos like that? I, I don't know enough about it. And Jimmy probably knows more about it than I do. I mean, I, I don't know that they have a lot of discretion, okay? They have a lot of discretion in what cases they take. They don't take every case over at the U.S. Attorney's Office. They obviously, I mean, look, there's, a, there's, a, there's been a longstanding epidemic of, of fake prescriptions, fake steroids, lots of fake drugs coming into this country that are labeled as the real thing, and what, it's what we call a misbranding case. But they have the discretion not to take those cases, and they often don't. They pass them down to the state. Uh, to deal with because the penalty levels on a misbranding case at the federal level are such that they're like, eh, this is probably going to be a probation case. We're not going to waste our resources on that. So, I mean, it's a pretty serious deal when you're importing fake, fake drugs <laughs> into the U.S. Well, so, in my you experience, know. most of those cases are real drugs. They're just not FDA approved. Correct. So, they're, they're you know, yeah. It's really, or or they're the, the, the government can't prove that it's not the real thing. Right. It's just not doesn't have the U.S. government stamp of approval on him, so we're going to prosecute you. Well, and in fact, one of the cases I had was with Ryan Patrick when he was an ADA. Uh, and it was a, it was a, um, one of these synthetic cases that was declined by the U.S. Attorney's Office. And Ryan had actually gotten three experts. It's the first prosecutor I've ever seen who hired, hired three experts to review the uh, chemical makeup of the substance. And one expert said, absolutely, it mimics what you know, steroids should do. Uh, and the other one said, nope, it doesn't. It doesn't mimic what steroids can do. And the third one said, they're both full of crap because nobody knows what the hell it does at all. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So we got a dismissal on it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, so I, I, I think that, and here's the thing, I've, I've never handled a federal death penalty case, but I know in talking to people who have, that that decision is, is not made at the U.S. Attorney's Office locally. That decision mm. is made in Washington ultimately whether to be able to seek death in a case. You have to get approval from Maine Justice uh, in order to get that, so. And there's a procedure beforehand for the lawyers to go up there and make right. a case for not seeking death. That's right, and so I, I, I just wonder what types of cases, I mean, they've put this mandate out here and this almost feels like just a lot of lip service to make people feel good that they're trying to bring back some sort of war on drugs, because I really don't see a case... Bring back war on drugs? Well, I mean, in full force. Well, because in, because under Obama, you know, they, they oh. kind of scaled back a little bit on that. Okay. Well, they were, letting people, they were letting people out early from prison. Okay. There was a lot of controversy within the office of people, uh, of them making, uh, making AUSA sign off on, on um, uh, the... Uh, why am I, why am I the, the pardons and um, clemency? You know, the clemencies. I know two yeah. very good lawyers out of state who got pardoned by Obama. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there were a lot. There was a lot of backlash from AUSAs who who didn't want to see that go through. Um, I think the war on drugs has been doing just fine. I think it's been a profitable business for DEA and everybody else. But I, I don't know. I just I just don't see a case where they could legitimately bring this. I mean, if they're not going to bring it against El Chapo and, and, and that kind, those kind of people, and they're going to cut deals with them and, and, and not seek death against them, are you really going to seek it against a doctor because somebody dies from overprescribing Nexium or whatever? Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, seriously. Um, what, what, whatever the, the, the drug is that, that you overprescribe to them and they get addicted to it and they ultimately die. Uh, Adderall, whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just don't see a way that they're going to re that they're going to be willing that somebody's going to be willing to sign their name to seek a death penalty case on, say, a doctor for this for overprescribing or, or causing somebody's death for overprescribing them yeah. some yeah. medication. So you think it was just a show? I think in like, part. Like when George Bush. And put out, I'm going to move for a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage kind of thing. No one wasn't going to fly, but it showed where his stance was, maybe. And maybe it makes an impression on the doctors if they recognize that, they, you know, that hmm. that's something that could even conceivably be on the table. Of course, I don't think it could even conceivably be on the table for an accidental uh, or you know, negligent or even reckless death, but yeah. uh, maybe. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. Wrong. I'm if I, doctors. I may be wrong. <laughs> we, we don't Call know. Jimmy. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> this is terrible. I can't. I mean, it, you know, my the idea that doctors would be beholden to money over their duty to their client. Well, but look at look at the. I, I look at what big pharma is with the prescription drug industry as to what tobacco was. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they are very the. I thought what? you were going to say El Chapo. No. <laughs> Big Pharma is like the El Chapo of well, North America. I mean, I mean, if you want it, you could yeah. theoretically draw that conclusion. But I, but I do look at it more like the tobacco industry. I mean, look at all the ads that they put out, and they, they, they say, oh, this will help you do this. If, you know, and then they rattle off a million side effects that, that could happen to you in the in the course and scope of Die. The, you yeah. could right. die. You could die. Yeah, you, yeah, you could. You could. And this is deflecting from the real problem, obviously. Right. Because then the real problem is not the doctors it's or big pharma. seeking death. Yeah. It's, it's and so then do you people. hold the, the, the executives accountable? Which brings us to persuasion. Because big pharma is using scientific persuasion, principles of psychology, research that's been done by, by uh, scientists in labs to figure out how to get us hooked on this stuff. Yeah. And look, they're putting kids on it at such an early age and have been now for the past two decades with Ritalin and all the, the ADHD medication. I, I mean, it's, it's insane. So you're, 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 getting a, you're getting people hooked on these things at a younger age. Uh, and I mean, how the, Ritalin's basically speed. Yeah. It is. So you're getting seven and eight year olds hooked on speed. They're, when they, when they, if they even try to come off of it, I mean, the crash is going to be really, really hard. You know, I mean, how do they sustain that sort of thing? So, I don't know. And, I, and there's a theory that that's part of a war on boys, that boys right. are being diagnosed as ADHD for conduct that it's 20, just 30 years boys. ago was just being boys. Right, right. I mean, gosh, I don't know. I don't know where this mandate really practically p plays in. Um, I don't know how they uh, how that's going to have what it's actually going to do, and if anybody's going to try to seek a prosecution using this. I mean, hell, he might be he might be impeached before and removed <laughs> before anything can happen. And if not, how do we feel about a U.S. Attorney General who's going around blustering about things that aren't going to happen? Mm. Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, what are the the Keebler Elf? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like it. I swear, I swear he does. The key hey, it's free speech, okay? Get back to making yeah, your it's, cookies. It's free speech. Uh, I say what I want. <laughs> we had no calls tonight. I think people were listening. I think we had. A are we actually on the air? I think <laughs> this we has are. occurred to me. We I might mean, not the, actually be on the air. The red lights are on. We've, oh. had nothing. We've had nothing on Twitter. We've had nothing on the phones. We're down to a minute left in the show, and not a damn thing. It's because I wasn't in the booth. Working is that why? Magic. Uh, we're gonna. Uh, yeah. We're just too engaging. People are just so I fascinated by us, so I think hypnotized they're watching. by us that uh, I think they're watching. We didn't even get to talk about loop the theory. The I know no, we didn't. We got too much time. attention and rapport that they're just like following. I think uh, uh, that, that happens. It's, it's a great so thing. We got to talk about it at some point. So okay. quickly, Victoria, what's the next step with your case? So now I'm going to file a post submission brief for um, a couple points that we want to clear up and um, they're taking it into sub and they've taken it under submission so we'll see if what they do and if it doesn't go well then I think PDR yep. petition for discretionary review to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals they refuse most of them but you know at some point we'll hammer with them with so many that they'll start granting them on First Amendment cases and maybe this is the one do you guys have any other cases that are of interest going up to the Supreme Court or, or to the look Court of at Appeals? First Amendment stuff? Well, just the harassment one is the only other one that I've got. The one that I'm going to have the writ hearing on. Do you think there's any other statutes out there that uh, that may apply? Revenge porn, child porn, uh, online impersonation. Online. Uh, yeah, there's there's lots of stuff. I'd have to think about it to give you a list, like those nine categories. Right. But well, but yeah, so revenge porn. I'm arguing in Tyler um, next month. Very oh. good. Very good. We're going to keep an eye out for that, and we'll have you back on the show to talk about it. So that's all the cool. time we have for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to thank Victoria Afresiglu and Mark Bennett for joining us tonight. Appreciate you guys coming on, and uh, we'll see you guys next week for another episode of Reasonable Doubt. Good night. <laughs>